The Meditations of Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Book 7 What is vice? Tis what you have often seen. Have this thought ready on all emergences that there are such things as you have often seen. You'll find all things, earlier or later, just the same. Such matters as fill all histories of the ancient or middle or present ages. Of such things all cities and families are full. Nothing is new. Everything is ordinary and of short duration. How can the grand maxims of life ever become dead in the soul, unless the opinions suitable to them be extinguished? And it is still in your power to revive and kindle again these true opinions. I can always have the sentiments I ought to have about such things. Why, then, am I disturbed? What is external to my soul is of no consequence to it. Be thus persuaded, and you stand upright and firm. You may revive when you please. Consider things again as you have done formerly. This is reviving again. The vain solicitude about shows, scenical representations, flocks and herds, skirmishing, little bones cast in for contention among little dogs, baits cast into a fish pond, the toiling of ants and their carrying of burdens, the fluttering of affrighted flies, the involuntary agitations of puppets by wires, we ought to persist amidst such things with good nature, without storming at them, and be persuaded that such is the worth of each person, as is the value of the things he pursues. In conversation we should give good heed to what is said, and in business to what is done, in the former that we may understand what is signified, and in the latter to what end it is referred. Is my understanding sufficient for this subject or not? If it is sufficient, I use it as an instrument given me by the universal nature for this work. If it is not, I either give place in this work to those who can better execute it, unless it be some way incumbent as duty upon me. And in that case I execute it as well as I can, taking the aid of those who, by directing my mind, can accomplish something seasonable and useful to the public. For whatever I do, whether by myself or with the assistance of others, ought to be directed to that alone which is useful and suitable to the public. How many of those who were once much celebrated are now delivered up to oblivion? And how many of those who sung the praises of others are now entirely gone? Don't be ashamed to take assistance. Your design should be to discharge your duty, as it is a soldier's to storm a breach in a wall. What if, because of your lameness, you cannot mount the works alone? You may do it with the assistance of others. Be not disturbed about futurity. You shall come to encounter with future events, possessed of the same reason you now employ in your present affairs. All things are linked with each other and bound together with a sacred bond. Scarce is there one thing quite foreign to another. They are all arranged together in their proper places and jointly adorn the same world. There is one orderly, graceful disposition of the whole. There is one God in the whole. There is one substance, one law, and one reason common to all intelligent beings, and one truth, as there must be one sort of perfection to all beings, who are of the same nature, and partake of the same rational power. Everything material shall soon vanish, and be swallowed up in the matter of the whole. Every act of principle shall soon be resumed in the intelligence and cause of the whole, and the memory of everything shall soon be buried in eternity. In the rational being the same conduct is agreeable to nature and agreeable to reason. Either show yourself as one always upright, or as one well corrected and amended. As the several members are in an organized body, such are all rational beings, though distant in place, since both are fitted for one joint operation. This thought will more deeply affect your heart if you often speak to yourself thus, I am a member of that great rational body or system. If you merely call yourself a part of mankind, you don't yet love mankind from your heart, nor does the doing of good yet ultimately delight you without further views. You only do good as a matter of duty and obligation, and not as doing at the same time the greatest good to yourself. Let external things affect as they please the things which can be affected by them. Let those complain of them which suffer by them. But if I can prevent any apprehension that the event is evil, I am not hurt, and it is in my power to prevent it. Let, you, let anyone do or say what he pleases, I must be a good man. Just as if the gold, the emerald, or the purple were always saying, Let men do or say what they please, I must continue an emerald and retain my luster. Is not the governing part the sole cause of its own disturbance? Does it not raise in itself its fears, its sorrows, its desires? If any other thing can raise its fears or sorrows, let it do so. Tis in its own power not to be moved by opinions about such incidents. Let the despicable body take thought, if it can, for itself lest it suffer anything and complain when it suffers. The soul which is terrified or dejected, or which is struck with imaginations or opinions about such things, would suffer, noth would suffer nothing if you would all not give it up to such imaginations.
The governing part is free from all indigence or dependence, if it doesn't make itself indigent. In like manner, it may be free from all disturbance and obstruction if it doesn't disturb and obstruct itself. To have good fortune is to have a good divinity governing our lot, or a good divinity within governing us. Be gone then imagination. Go by the gods, as you came, for I have no more use of you. You came according to the old custom. I am not angry with you, only be gone. Does one dread a change? What can arise without changes? What is more acceptable or more usual to the nature of the whole? Can you warm your baño unless wood undergoes a change? Can you be nourished unless your food is changed? Or can anything useful be accomplished without changes? Don't you see then that your undergoing a change too may be equally necessary to the nature of the whole? Through the substance of the universe, as through a torrent, flow all particular bodies, all of the same nature, and fellow workers with the whole, as the same members of our body cooperate with each other. How many Chrysippus and Socrates and Epictetus hath the course of ages swallowed up? Let this thought occur to you about every person and event. About this alone I am solicitous, that I may not do anything unsuitable to the constitution of a man, or in another manner than it requires, or in a time not suitable. The time approaches when you shall forget all things and be forgotten by all. Tis the part of a man to love even those who offend him, and this one may do if he would consider that those who offend are our kindred by nature, that they offend through ignorance and unwillingly, and that in a little both we and they must die, and especially that they have done thee no damage, for they cannot make thy soul worse than it was before. The presiding nature forms out of the universal substance as out of wax, sometimes a colt, and then changing that again out of its matter forms a tree, and afterwards a man, and then something different, and each of these forms subsisted a little while. There can be nothing dismal in a chest's being taken asunder, as there was nothing dismal in its being at first joined together. A wrathful countenance is exceedingly against nature. When the countenance is often thus deformed, its beauty dies and cannot be revived again. By this very thing you may apprehend that it is against reason. If the sense of moral evil is gone, what reason could one have for desiring to live? All things you behold shall the nature presiding in the universe change, and out of their substance make other things and others again out of theirs, that the universe may always be new. When one has offended or done anything wrong, consider what opinion of his about some good or evil hath led him into this misconduct. When you discover this, you will pity him, and neither be surprised nor angry. Perhaps you yourself may imagine the same thing, or some such like thing to be good. If you don't look at all upon such things as good or evil, you can easily be indulgent and gentle to those who are in a mistake. Don't let your thoughts dwell upon what you want, so much as upon what you have. And consider the things you enjoy which are dearest to you, how earnestly and anxiously you would desire them if you wanted them. And yet be on your guard, lest by your delighting in the enjoyment of such things you inure yourself to value them too much, so that if you should lose them you would be much disturbed. Wind thyself, up, wind thyself up within thyself. The rational governing part has this natural power, that it can fully satisfy itself in acting justly, and by doing so enjoying tranquility. Blot out all imaginations. Stop the brutal impulses of the passions. Circumscribe the present time and apprehend well the nature of everything which happens, either to yourself or to others. Distinguish between the material and the active principle. Consider well the last hour. The fault another commits there, let it rest where the guilt resides. Apply your mind attentively to what is said in conversation, and enter deeply into what is done and into those who do it. Rejoice yourself with simplicity, modesty, and the thoughts of the indifference of all things between virtue and vice. Love mankind, and be obedient to the gods. Says one all things by certain laws, but what if all be elements and no more? Tis sufficient that even in that case all happens by an inevitable law, except a very few things. Concerning death, tis either a dispersion, or atoms, a vanishing, an extinction, or a translation to another state. Concerning pain, what is intoler intolerable must soon carry us off. What is lasting is tolerable. The understanding can preserve a calm by its opinions, and the governing part becomes no worse. The parts which suffer by pain, let them determine about it if they can. Concerning glory, consider the understandings of those who confer praises what they shun, and what they pursue. And as heaps of sand are driven upon one another, the latter bury and hide the former. Just so in life the former ages are presently buried by the ensuing. This from Plato. 
to the man who has a true grandeur of soul and a view of the whole of time and of all substance, can human life appear a great matter? Tis impossible, says he. Can then such a one conceive death to be terrible? Tis impossible. Tis a saying of Antisthenes, tis truly royal to do good and be reproached. Tis unworthy that our countenance should be obedient to, your, to our soul, and change and compose itself as the soul directs, while yet the soul cannot conform and adorn itself according to its own inclination. Vain is all anger at the external things, for they regard it nothing. Give joy to us and to the immortal gods. For life is like the load in the ear, cut down, and some must fall and some unreaped remain. Me and my children, if the gods neglect, it is for some good reason. For I keep right and justice on my side. Don't sorrow along with them, nor be inwardly moved. Tis thus in Plato, I would give him, I would give him this just answer. You are much mistaken, man, to think that a man of any worth makes much account between living and dying. Ought he not to consider this alone, whether he acts justly or unjustly, the part of a good or of a bad man? He says again, In truth, O Athenians, wheresoever one has placed himself by choice, judging it the fittest for him, or wheresoever he is placed by his commander, there I think he ought to say, stay at all hazards, making no account of death or any other evil but vice. Again, but pray, consider whether what is truly noble and good be not placed in something else than preserving life or in being preserved. Nor is it so very desirable to one of a truly manly disposition to continue in life a long time, nor ought he to love it much. But he should rather commit this to the will of God, assenting to the maxim of even our old woman, that no man can avoid his destiny, and study how he shall pass as virtually, virtuously as he can the time destined for him. Consider the course of the stars as thinking that you revolve along with them, consider also continually the changes of the elements into each other. Such extensive thoughts purge of the filth, this terrestrial life. This is beautiful in Plato. When we consider human life, we should view as from a high tower all things terrestrial, such as herds, armies, men employed in agriculture, in marriages, divorces, births, deaths, the tumults of courts of justice, desolate lands, various barbarous nations, feasts, wailings, markets, a medley of all things in a system adorned by contrarieties. Consider things past, the revolutions of so many empires, and thence you may foresee what shall happen thereafter, for they shall be just of the same nature, nor can they break off the harmony or concert now begun. Hence it is much the same to view human life for forty or for a myriad of years, for what further can you see? To earth returns whatever sprung from earth, but what's of heavenly seed remounts to heaven. Euripides intends by this either the disentangling again of the entangled atoms, or some such dispersion of immutable elements. By meats and drinks and charms and magic arts, death's course they would divert and thus escape. The gale that blows from God we must endure, toiling but not repining.